How are you? Are you well rested after the break? So, my, my name is Marco. Um, I'm amazed that my surname got pronounced right. Um, anyways, I work for Stack Overflow. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the architecture, uh, so how do we uh, build stuff. And first thing, um, so there is uh, this fantastic QR code. If you scan it, you'll be able to follow along uh, the slides. Okay, it's, I don't know if it works, but you can try. Anyways, um, so we are, by the way, we are a, a C Sharp company. Um, so we use C Sharp, we are not Node.js. And before anybody of you asks me the question that asks me every time, why don't you use Node.js or whatever? Okay, if you do that, I'm gonna make fun of you because of left pad, okay? So be careful. Anyway, so architecture. So I looked up uh, the definition of architecture and it says the art of science of building. Specifically, the art or practice of designing and building structures, especially habitable ones. Of course, in our case, you know, a software architecture is not about building houses, it's about building software, but it's the same concept. And um, architecture is actually something that existed for a long time. It was studied since uh, we have texts uh, talking about architecture uh, that are more than 2,000 year, years old. And one thing that was notable even at the time is uh, three characteristics that make the concept of architecture. So three things that architected things must have. So the first thing is durability, right? So you're building a house, you're building a temple, you don't want the temple to melt down when it's raining, for example. Uh, the second thing is utility, right? You, you created your fantastic temple, you forgot to put in the doors, and you, know, you can't go into it, so it doesn't really work. So, it, so you need to have something that doesn't fall down, and something that you can actually use. But it's more interesting the third characteristic that a good architecture must have, and it's beauty. And uh, you can see how, for example, for a church or for a temple or for even for a house or a villa, it may be something obvious, right? You want it to be beautiful. Um, but how does it work with code, right? And uh, this is open to interpretation, uh, in, but in our case, uh, we certainly have uh, um, interpreted this as to mean um, performance. So for us, it's important that the code that we, that we build is very efficient, and uh, efficiency is the ability to do something without, without waste. So um, there is one good way um, that we are, a method that we know all about uh, that uh, is very, very efficient and allows us to get to solutions um, which perform, uh, they have maximized their performance very easily. And that method is the scientific method. So uh, if you think about it, uh, when, when, people, when you have scientists doing science, what they do is uh, they, they have some observations and they um, uh, think of a theory or, or some model that will explain the observations and use that model to make predictions, and then they make experiments, and then they verify whether these experiments are actually, uh, are, are actually confirming or disproving the hypothesis. So the most important bit in here are these three, these small three-step cycle here, you know, where, where, you gather, where you gather data, you refine and uh, alter, expand, so you analyze your data and you build new theories all the time. And we basically did something very similar. So uh, when, when, we, when we do code, we build, uh, build code, we build the product, we measure performance, and then we analyze the measurements, and this allows us to define how to build the rest, uh, the, the rest of the product. So the first thing that anybody is going to ask you, uh, if you are a customer and you want someone to design a church for you, they're going to ask you, okay, so you want like something small, what's your budget, you know, or something big? So knowing the characteristics of uh, what you're building is very important. 
And um, therefore, uh, this, this whole talk would be meaningless unless I told you a little bit about Stack Overflow and uh, the kind of scale that we have. So you can uh, sort of relate or, or see why we go to such lengths to do, to do these things. So first of all, uh, this is the top sites according to Quantcast, which is one of the two top measurement uh, agencies that tell you how many uh, unique visitors you have every month. Um, Stack Overflow would be between 17 and 18. It's not there for a couple of reasons, and, but the most important one is that we half our traffic is actually split around all our network of sites. So Stack Overflow is part of a larger network of um, 160 different sites with different topics that go from cooking to English to Japanese to philosophy or physics. So um, Quantcast doesn't really work very well for this kind of setup. And therefore, they split all the traffic in different uh, blocks. But putting them together, we would be somewhere between Wikipedia and PayPal, which is pretty big. Um, by the way, I was telling you it's not very, you know, Quantcast is not very reliable. I can tell you why. Um, so does anybody remember this coming out maybe in September? So basically, North Korea screwed up their, their uh, border router configuration, and turns out they have 28 websites in the whole country. So you can imagine them, you know, all like that. And according to Quantcast, what are they looking at? Stack Overflow. <laughs> so apparently, we're very popular in North Korea. So no, you can trust these numbers, clearly. But OK, it's just funny. Anyway, so I've been giving some version of this talk since 2013. Um, when, I, when I started giving this talk, we had um, somewhere around 100 websites in our network that I was talking about. Nowadays, we have 160. And we are still growing, of course. And um, these are page views. So again, Quantcast, so believe it, you know, take it or leave it. Um, but we were around 400 million uh, page views per month when I joined and when I started talking about this. And nowadays, we are actually over 1, 1 billion, 1 1.2 billion per month. And this is not really up to date. On the other hand, the number of web servers was one in 2008 when the, when the site started. Then it grew a bit uh, to five in 2009, 2010. And then in 2011, we went to nine web servers. And ever since then, I started talking and we grew, like we doubled up our traffic, tripled up our traffic, and we're still on nine web servers. So to give you an idea, I was looking today at uh, some stats for uh, some other sites which are there uh, in, the, in that list. So Pinterest, which is two steps up, uh, on top of us, in 2012 has 150 servers. Um, Wikipedia, which is, I think, below us or just above us, uh, I have more or less 10 times the amount of hardware that we have. So uh, how do we do this? We do this with this small, poor man's um, scientific method, build, measure, analyze. So I'm going to give you a few examples very quickly because time runs out. So first of all, with the hardware. So this is an actual picture of our own uh, server farm, server farm, three racks. And as you can see, there's not much there. There are mostly databases. All the stuff that you see up here, uh, all these numerous things here, they're all disk drives. Uh, because uh, we have a lot of content, right? So our main concern is actually running out of space. It's not running out of power. So what do we do? We serve the site, and then we have this fantastic dashboard, which is an open source project called Observer, which allows you to measure um, the performance of all the servers in, in it. And as you can see uh, in, the, in this screenshot, can you read it? Yes? So up here, uh, there are the database servers. 
And you can see we, we got four. And the way they're set up, uh, there are two for the network and two just for Stack Overflow. Uh, of each pair, one is read-only and the other one also accepts writes. So basically there is only one server doing the actual hard work. And uh, <laughs> this one has got a lot of RAM. Um, even though nowadays, you know, there is common to see uh, terabytes of RAM. Uh, so these are the web servers. So this one runs like promotions and not the sites. The sites are actually on this line here. And as you can see, this is a typical day and their CPU is like 5%, 10%. So we have not only, we only run on nine, but these nine web servers are really, really under capacity. So we could lose a few of them and still be up and nobody would notice. In fact, Sometimes when there is something dangerous, we just take one out of the, uh, out of, uh, um, the uh, load balancer and try to deploy stuff in there to see if it goes crazy. If it goes crazy, we can just shut it up, uh, shut it down, and nobody cares because the traffic is gonna just go. In fact, uh, we have calculated that we could probably use just one web server and save all the traffic if we were crazy enough. Um, after, we get all this data, what we do is we do one big spreadsheet and we try to understand how much space are we going to need next year. And then based on that, we buy, this, buy new disks or buy new servers and so, and so on. So again, uh, it's literally physically build, uh, measure and, and analyze the data. And this is the architecture overall. I just wanted to give a quick um, overview of what it is. So on top here, this is where you are, right? So the requests come in here, go through the routers, all the borderline stuff. They go through a load balancer, which is like one machine active and one machine is just standby. And they go into the famous nine web servers. And in the back end, there is really very little. Uh, there, there is Redis, uh, which runs on two boxes. There is Elasticsearch that runs on three, and we use that for searching. Um, the service tier, this is more interesting. Uh, what this does is uh, it, it's a specialized index of question and questions and tags. Are you familiar with the way Stack Overflow works? You know, I have questions as a tag, so you know, this question is C-sharp, this question is not JS or whatever. And, uh, when you navigate the site, especially if you're logged in, we try to guess uh, which questions are going to be uh, interesting to you. And we do that based on tags. So there is a lot of querying going, Boolean querying going on with the, with the tags. And that actually uh, can't be performed by a SQL Server. That would be cr absolutely crazy. Um, so we moved on to something, having something completely memory but that also was too much, and then so we move it to a, to a separate server, which only does that. And then finally, we have a SQL server. So again, uh, build, measure, analyze. Um, that particular build, measure, analyze that I just shown was uh, actually uh, quite slow, right? Um, you can do maybe a yearly hardware refresh cycle. If you're using the cloud, uh, you can increase the number of servers if you need to, but in any, in any case, you don't do that like second by second. Um, it's something that you do with time. Uh, whereas it's important to have these cycles uh, optimized for speed. So if you can do this cycle very quickly, it's important because um, what this cycle does is takes your solution, your product, it just changes it slightly in the way it's implemented so it fits better your condition. And the faster you can iterate, the quicker it converges to an optimal solution. So an example of this is um, actual code, right? So this is an example of code. I'm going to show it again later. Um, one thing that you can see in here and that we optimize um, for is that um, this code, basically, uh, what it does, it takes all the table out of the DB. This table contains content. Uh, in particular, it contains our health center. And it stores it in, a, in cache. 
and it stores it in a static object and it's there for use. And, and all this stuff is done in 10 lines of code. And the reason is, you know, the less code you write, the faster you are in this step, the faster your cycle is. So it's important. Um, how do we measure that? So once you have your pages being rendered, uh, normal users just see the site, right? So they just see the, the page. Um, us developers see up here a, uh, a small rectangle with the time. So this page actually took uh, 100, no, so yeah, 151, uh, 191 milliseconds to, to render. This was really, really slow for some reason. In any case, you can see what's wrong if you're a developer, you can go up there, click, click on it, and you get actually a complete breakdown on how the page was rendered, where time was spent. Was it spent uh, in this column here, which is SQL? Was it spent on Redis calls? Uh, was it spent on Elastic? If there is some Elastic calls in there, we, we, you would also have a column. And this tells you pretty much what you need to optimize and what the problems are. Not only that, but profiling everything at every, uh, um, at every call allows us to actually store a subset of this data and uh, put it in a, SQL, uh, in a SQL database. So not only I can see this particular page, what happened in this particular uh, rendering instance, but I can also run averages over the last day, for example, and see, okay, how is the site, how, how is this, particular page um, performing today. And that allows you, uh, allows me, to actually get to graphs like this one. So this is just something I did on a random day um, to tweet about it. But as you can see, this is a question page. So when you, when you go on Google and say, okay, how do I parse HTML with a regex, uh, you land on our page, and uh, this is that page. So these are the mes measurements for that page. And as you can see, Rendering that page takes between maybe 20, 10 and 20 milliseconds for most part. And you can see also in here that uh, about two, three milliseconds are spent on average in, uh, in SQL. And Redis is like crazy. It's like sub milliseconds. We can't even measure it for most, most part. And it's also interesting to see that there are some spikes here. Those spikes are things that went wrong, garbage collections, and so on, and so pages which are not performing as well as they could. For example, the one I was showing before had some problem. It would definitely be in this small spike there. So of course, you know, understanding which pages uh, perform worse allows you to focus your effort in, in making them faster. And this is how you get pages that render in 10 milliseconds. Uh, I'm pretty sure your application is not as fast as this if you do web. Um, so having all these optimizations would be not very useful unless the cycling would, would, was fast. In fact, I, I think our cycling is pretty, it's pretty fast. Uh, so I eventually went on and measured um, how many deployments we do on, on, on those nine web servers every day. So when I joined, I was told it was five. They lied to me. Uh, it was, uh, so I joined somewhere around here. And actually it was five, like the first month though. And then went down and then it's growing back up again. So we are around five, four, four or five deployments a day, which is actually pretty good, at least according to my former career where a deployment took six months. Um, by the way, does anybody know why there is this spike here of like a gazillion developments just for that month? Anybody can guess? Sorry? Rejects? No. <laughs> so this is uh, because we released documentation and which is like a major expansion of the site. It's like a new, a, completely new part in which there are many examples, documentations for uh, languages and features. Uh, and of course, that came out with a large number of bugs and large number of consequent deployments. 
So I was telling you before uh, about the Help Center. Uh, so the Help Center um, is just a, a, a random part of the site. It's not a major part of the site, but even that is optimized. And as I was showing you before, so this is the code that actually is a complete storage of all the, uh, all the uh, Help Center articles. They're just you know, blatantly stored in memory. They're stored in a global variable, which is something that if you went to any computer science course, they would have told you never to do, and we do it. Um, it's all, everything is cached. The global cache is a nice object that what it does, it looks in memory. Do I have it in memory? Yes, okay, here it goes. If I don't have it in memory, I'll look on Redis. Do I have it in Redis? No. Okay, then otherwise I'll just execute this lambda over here. We've got lambdas now in Node.js, right? And, um, and this is our ORM layer, two lines of code. Uh, basically, this opens up a connection, and this part runs and maps this SQL. So as you can see, uh, the code is very, is very tight, and it's actually using a lot of this particular way of doing things where we use a lot of global stuff, a lot of static stuff, which in a language like C Sharp is really, really not something you should be doing. And we do it because it's fast. It's really, really damn fast. Um, there are also examples of caching which are really strange. Um, for example, this is actually the answer to should I, how can I parse HTML with the regex? You can't. Uh, anyways, this is just a question. It's a very popular, uh, popular answer, sorry. And uh, as all answers, there is up there, there is uh, three small tabs. They allow you to change the order of the answers, whether you want to see the latest active one, the oldest one, or the most voted one on top. So that's a completely static content. You know, there's nothing in it uh, that you need to do. You know, there is no calculations, there is nothing. The only thing that we need to do in order to display that in the back end is actually create objects for the three tabs and then we just render them, right? Except that code is on a page which is rendered 1.2 billion times a month. So that's a lot, a hell of a lot of objects that are created here. So in order to further optimize the code, it actually makes sense to um, cache in memory those three objects so we, we just create them once instead of creating them every time. Um, the reason for this is garbage collection. And if you do Node.js, you should be worrying about garbage collection, even though you may not have been thinking about it so far. Um, what garbage collection is, is the magic thing that allows you to create new objects, and then you never have to delete them. You know, in the old times when people actually used C, uh, you couldn't just create something out of nowhere. The way to do, to do it, of course, is you know, to ask the runtime, OK, give me a chunk of memory. Then you use it, and then you give it back and say, OK, I don't need it anymore. If you forget to give it back, then you keep on using more and more memory, and then in the end, you run out of memory. But in a managed language like, like JavaScript or C Sharp, you don't actually need to give back memory because the system is so smart that it figures out, OK, you don't need this stuff anymore, so I'll just reclaim the memory for you. And this is done by a thread, a backend thread uh, called the garbage collector. And what it does, it takes all your objects, all your functions, all your contexts, and goes through and see which one depends on which, and which one is still alive, which one is out of scope. And then it clears up all the space. This is great because it allows your code to be very simple, but it sucks because uh, in order to do this, the garbage collector needs to actually uh, freeze all, uh, all your code from, prevent your code from running at some point and just clear up everything. So if you, got, if you create a lot of instances or if you get, create very complicated instances, um, then um, this, becomes, uh, this becomes complicated and, and it takes a long time. So you don't want to do that. One example is dependency injection. So this is something that you do a lot with, uh, with testing, right? Uh, so instead of creating objects, instead of uh, getting them from the DB, what do you do? You create a container, and that container is a magic object that knows how to build stuff, 
and it knows whether you're testing or not testing. And if you're testing, it gives you a test object. And if you're not testing, it's going to give you uh, the real object. So you can like decouple stuff. You, you can do stuff without going to uh, the database and so on. Right? You can do fantastic stuff like this. Right? So you, you, want, you go to the repository and say, uh, I want to get this thing. And then uh, and you don't know what it does, right? It could be if you be going to a mock object, but in this case, it particularly is doing a lot of things, like it do, it's doing validation, security, login, and so on. And you can't do this again because, in reality, what you're doing behind the scenes in the in the in the, in the repository is you're creating a bunch of objects to do all this stuff, and we can't do that. In fact, we can't do that, and therefore testing gets really really hard. And therefore, there you go. Uh, we have very, very few tests in, in the code. Basically, we don't unit test at all. Um, so build, measure, analyze, uh, more stuff. Right, so I was telling you about, uh, about unit tests, right? Um, yeah, that's the most interesting man in the world. Uh, so that's pretty much our strat testing strategy. Um, so what happens when you, when you do this, right? So what happens is, okay, if you do it in your, like, sort of in a financial institution, it's really bad. If you're a site like Stack Overflow with your main customers are developers, you get bug reports, right? So we have automated testers. Actually, a lot of them do JavaScript, and what happens is we actually get <laughs> the solution. <laughs> so there you go. See, this is how you approximate stuff so you, know, you do the best of your condition. Anyway, so. <laughs> Anyways, if you think you, you have pressure, we do have pressure, okay? So we go down and we go, we go on TechCrunch, okay? This is, this, is not, this is not a fake. Okay, build, measure, analyze. And it's another cycle that we have. Okay, it's not exactly that. In, in practice is, you know, uh, you hire great programmers or programmers that really have a lot of passion for what they do. Hackers. And then you give them the right tools for the job, right? So you empower them. You give them you know, the harder they want, the softer they want, uh, the trust they want. And what they do is create great code or performance code. And having a great code base, having a successful product is what gets you, again, the right kind of people that you want to have in your company. So this is another kind of cycle that we have, but we are very conscious about it, and it's very much part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I was just going to talk about hackers, and this is what came out, like a 90s movie. So no, real hackers look like this. OK, not really. In the 70s, though. Can anybody guess what company this is? <laughs> yeah, there's Bill Gates, right? Uh, so yes, so we have a policy where you can get all, all, the, all the tools that you want. And this, having three monitors is absolutely normal. And you know, uh, having your favorite click, clicky keyboard or you know, Visual Studio if you need it or whatever. So it's important to have all this thing. Uh, Coding-wise, we do stuff that, OK, people are actually, I've been discouraged from doing in all the other jobs I had. Like, for example, decompiling your intermediate code that gets rendered is something maybe you don't do in Node.js, but we do it all the time to, in order to, to improve performance. Or if you look at the database queries, look at the query plans, and optimize the query plans, and look at the, all the little bits and tweaks you can put into to make it just slightly faster. All right, so it's a cycle again, you know? Uh, hackers, tools, and, and results or code. So in conclusion, I have 15 seconds. OK, so performance is a feature and not a luxury, at least for us. Uh, as I was telling you, uh, you, know, you want to have a site that doesn't fall down, and you want a site that is usable, and, but it's, you want to have the code base, which is beautiful. And in our case, 
performance is the beauty of our core base. Uh, in order to optimize performance, you need to have cycles. And I'm pretty sure that no matter what your priorities are in your, in your uh, company, you're, you're seeing cycles. You, maybe you do agiles and you have weekly cycles. But you need to be very conscious about these cycles and optimize for them. You know, I'm pretty sure that most companies don't measure as much as we do. So all the cycles get all skewed up. Um, the results that you get are, become very, very specific to your case. As I was saying, you know, automated testers, this is specific to us. It won't work anywhere else. But it's also extremely high value. If you think about all that I talked about and how um, we can do code which is not testable, but then we can test it in another way, it's all a chain of things that work together. And this only works for us. And you need to build the same thing in your own case. You need to build the perfect architecture for your own case. If someone comes to you and tells you, just do whatever, architecture X, serverless, yeah, the new one, uh, is, everything's going to be better. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. You know? It really depends whether it fits you. Garbage collection is a pain at scale and, you know, and no JS too. Sorry. Um, so you need to hire hackers and hire people with a passion for coding that go beyond, you know, just merely doing a job for eight hours and then going home. And I need to insert a plug about Stack Overflow jobs, and this is how we monetize. So if you want the job, we got the job for you. And by <laughs> three monitors, because come on, they are cheap now. So anyway, so quick announcement. Um, you know we have badges to encourage good behavior. Um, we are giving away today and tomorrow this badge. It's, an, it's a silver badge called Not a Robot. In order to get it, you have to come and talk to me, and I give you a code to unlock one for yourself. And uh, this is just to encourage people to come and talk to us. That's the only reason that is there. So uh, that's the thing, and that's it. So that's my Twitter, uh, and that's the game. So thank you very much.